Okay, students, uh, welcome to our ecclesiology course at Elon Bible Institute and College. This is our second lecture of the semester. I uh, have quite a bit to cover in this lecture, so don't forget that uh, you need to break the lecture up into 15-minute increments. Um, <clears throat> so there may be, um, you know, three or four videos in this, and um, I'm actually recording this on the same day. Uh, that I recorded the last lecture. If you remember, my dog uh, was asleep. My dog is still asleep, and it's been probably two hours since I recorded the last lecture, but that animal is still asleep next to me, so my wife is headed home, so I'm not going to pause the video or anything if she has to come in and, and get the dog. We're just going to live in the real world, but my voice is going out a little bit, so uh, I'm going to be drinking throughout this lecture. I know that's probably uncouth, but kind of an uncouth guy. So anyway, all right, so a bunch of stuff in this lecture. We're going to talk about uh, use of the term ecclesia, or where do we get the word church from? And so um, probably going to spend more time on that than anybody else I've ever talked to. But I really want you to know where we get the term from. Because unfortunately, what you hear is not necessarily accurate. So I just want to make sure that, that you guys know why we use the term church. That's a very specific New Testament word. And then uh, we're going to talk about the nature of the church. Um, what are the elements of the church that comprises its nature? So we're going to talk about that. So really, those two big ideas... Uh, don't forget to break this up into um, into three different or uh, into different sections with 15 minute uh, sections. So, all right, here we go. Let's have a discussion of where we get the term church. One of the great things about being a professor is I get to talk about whatever I want to talk about. And I promise you that at the end of this discussion of where we got the term church, you're going to think that was interesting, but I'll probably never get that 15 minutes of my life back. But I'm the professor. I get to pick. So we'll do that after I take a drink. And then one day I'll introduce you guys to Cody, the wonder dog, who's in a coma. All right. <clears throat> All right, so the Greek term we typically translate as church is the Greek word ekklesia. It's where we get the term ecclesiology from or ecclesiastical. So a better translation of the term ekklesia would be assembly or congregation. That's really what that term means. So the question we should be asking is, if ecclesia is not translated church, if it's translated as assembly or congregation, why do we translate it as church? I'm so glad you asked. So let's talk about the etymology of ecclesia, of church. So. The word ecclesia has, it's one of 17 Greek words that was translated as synagogue in the first century. So it was used to identify various political institutions and volunteer organizations. Most people agree that church is not the best, the, the best translation of the word ecclesia. But it's the English word that has been adopted as the primary translation. So how did this happen? Okay, so church, the word church, is not derived from the Greek word ekklesia. It actually comes from the Greek word kyriakos, which is often translated that which is the Lord's. So instead of saying that the word church comes from ekklesia, we should instead say that we use the term church to translate the word ecclesia. Now, the difference is modest at best, but it's important because although the English 
Bible, the English translation of scripture continues to translate ecclesia as church. That's not what it means. So some people, and you probably heard this in a sermon, will say that ecclesia comes from two Greek words, ek, which means out, and kaleo, meaning I call. So some people will translate ecclesia uh, called out ones, but it is, it is more likely that ecclesia is derived from ek, which means out, and laos, which means people or of the people. So in the Septuagint, and just to remind you, the Old Testament was written entirely in Hebrew. But at some point, because Greek was the predominant language of trade across the Roman Empire, it was the, it was the common language in the, the known world, at least known to uh, North Africans, uh, Europeans, and uh, Eastern Europeans. So, so at some point, the, the Jewish people decided to translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. We call that Greek translation of the Old Testament the Septuagint. So, um, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, we see ecclesia used to mean assembly or congregation. I'll give you a couple of passages where we get that. So Deuteronomy 9.10 says that the Lord had spoken with you on the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, on the day of the ecclesia, on the day of the assembly, is the way that's translated into English. Deuteronomy 18.16, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the ecclesia, on the day of the assembly. So the use of ecclesia in the Septuagint informs its use in the New Testament more so than the use of ecclesia in Greek literature. And here's what I mean by that. In Greek literature, I said this a little earlier, that in secular Greek literature, you would see the term ecclesia to refer to political bodies or volunteer organizations. So when you see the word ecclesia in, um, in the New Testament, what we're doing is we're translating it based on its use in the Old Testament. So it's reasonable then that the New Testament use of ecclesia would be related to the covenantal people that were assembled before God in worship. Followers then, followers of Christ then, became part of the covenantal ecclesia seen in the Old Testament. So what does this mean? So kyriakos, kyriakos rather, is the word that we should translate as church. We translate ecclesia as church because of its use in the Septuagint to refer to the covenantal people of God who are who are assembled before the Lord in worship. Okay, so th that's really where we get the, the use of of ecclesia. So the term ecclesia then has become really an umbrella term to bridge ecclesia and Kyriakos. So when, when Jesus quoted scripture, he quoted from the Septuagint. I don't know if you knew that or not. He used the term ecclesia to refer to his followers. So Jesus was aware of how the word was used in the Old Testament. So he was connecting his followers to Jews who were under the Mosaic covenant. So to Jesus, those under the old covenant and his followers were both God's people. So, so, so ecclesia under any circumstance should be translated as church. Literally the word that is translated church 
is Kyriakos, Akos, rather, I'm sorry, Kyriakos. It, it means that which is the Lord's, the church. The reason we translate ecclesia as church is because it is, it is more descriptive of what the church is. Because that means then the word ecclesia, even though we translate it church, refers to God's people throughout history, the assembly, those assembled before the Lord. And so what we have done is we have purposefully mistranslated ecclesia to give it its proper theological meaning. And I hope that makes sense to you. So after all of that, after saying all of that, if you're preaching one day and you want to talk about um, where we get the term church from, my advice would be to skip everything I just said and say we get it from the word ecclesia. The only change I would make is I would probably not say it comes from ek kaleo, which means um, called out ones. I would say it's probably related more to, to ek laos, which is the people, you know, out of the people or of the people rather. Um, and so I think it's, um, you, you could even go a little further and you could say ecclesia is the word that is used in the New Testament that means the same thing as congregation or assembly in the Old Testament. That way you can, you can bridge the use to mean God's people. So if we think of the term church just in terms of, you know, post-resurrection people, people that have accepted Jesus, that doesn't capture the theological meaning uh, necessarily because the word is more related to the Old Testament than it is the new. So um, there you go. You'll never get that time back. So, so church, we'll just move forward. Church has two uses. And the reason I say this about the two uses is because sometimes people get hung up on it. So church has two meanings. Church means the universal church, right? Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock, I'll build my church, right? But it also means local church. Paul referred to the church at Thessalonica, right? The church of the Thessalonians. So, so don't try to make an argument that church only refers to the universal church because clearly in scripture, it has two meanings. You just need to make sure that uh, when you use the term, use it in the correct context, whether you're talking about the universal church or whether you're talking about the church in America or whether you're talking about um, Bed Springs Baptist Church in some small town. So it, it has two uses in scripture and both, both are theologically and grammatically correct. So what are the, what are the primary activities of the church? Now, when we say the primary activities of the church, we are talking about the primary activities of the church, at least as far as we can tell in scripture. I'm going to move my notes up here. I got my notes backwards a little bit. So I'm going to cheat and, and put my notes up here. Sorry about that. So as we probe the, the concept of ecclesia, of covenant people, uh, assembly, congregation, we discover a picture in the New Testament that emerges that the church is a community united in their relationship with God and others and who are focused on the reconciling love of God through Jesus and who are living in the power of the Holy Spirit. The church, the ecclesia, the congregation of, Israel, the congregation of, of God's people, the, the church is a community that exists to bear witness to the present and future kingdom of God. The church, then, is the people of God living in step with the kingdom of God, both now 
and in the future. And we'll, we'll kind of explore that future element, that eschatological element, in, in just a little bit. So here are the primary activities that the church engages in. So number one, the primary activity of the church is praise and worship of the Trinitarian God. And this is the second lecture for ecclesiology. And this is the second time that I have mentioned the Trinitarian God. If there's one thing that I want all of you to begin doing is is making sure that what you say reflects a theological reality. Typically, typically, we will say God to reference the Father, but then we will say Jesus or we'll say the Holy Spirit. It's just the way we talk. It's the language that's developed. And so it's very important to me that as you begin to think theologically, you're in college, you're preparing perhaps for ministry or preparing to go to graduate school so that you can teach this stuff one day. But whether you're going to be a teacher in the church, you know, formally and get paid for it, or if you're going to be a volunteer teacher in the church, it's very important to me that you begin thinking theologically. And when I'm, what I mean by that is, when, when you think of God, it's very important that you think specifically of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You don't have to say it that way. You can say God the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son. You can say God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. Because what, what I want you to do is every activity that we engage in, as the ecclesia, as the congregation of the faithful. Every activity we engage in is about praise and worship of the Trinitarian God. When we are singing songs about the, the suffering and the sacrifice of Jesus, and we raise our hands and we close our eyes and we and we bask in the glory of his redemption. We are not just worshiping the Son. We are worshiping the Trinitarian God because every member of the Trinity had a hand in creation, incarnation, atonement, resurrection, and our, our future uh, reality in the coming kingdom of God. And so this is the first activity of the church. It manifests itself in both corporate and private worship. It includes corporate worship, prayer, fasting, th those activities that we do that are worship uh, towards God. So that's the first activity of the church. The second activity of the church is service to others. Now, Jesus... He wanted his church to be concerned with justice and healing for those that the world had cast aside or forgotten. This is clear in Matthew 25. So the church is engaged in praise and worship. The church is engaged in ser service. Third, the church is engaged in generosity. So the church is to be comprised of people who don't give with a closed fist, but with open hands. Now, that's a big difference. If you have two people that are giving, two people that make the same amount of money, have the same resources, have the same amount of debt, have the same understanding of what their responsibility is, and one gives reluctantly with a closed fist, and one says, God, here's, here's my offering to you with an open hand. Uh, God accepts that sacrifice with an open hand. That is generosity. So the church engages in generosity. Uh, fourth, the church engages in interdependence. So I mentioned this a little bit in the last lecture. The body, the body of Christ is dependent on all members for life. There are no members separate from the body. So we depend on one another and we are to be in fellowship with one another. And then lastly, uh, this is not the last thing the church engages in, but the last big 
uh, thing the church engages in is forgiveness. We forgive because we have been forgiven. So the church is a, a community that worships, a community that serves, a generous community, an interdependent community, and a community that forgives. We forgive. We forgive members of the body. We forgive people who are outside of the body. We forgive because we have been forgiven. All right. So this might be a good time for you to pause and uh, um, and uh, get ready for uh, the next lecture, which we're going to look at images of the church. Okay, so let's look at some popular images. There are um, at least 96 different images or analogies of the church in the New Testament. Um, body of Christ, letter of Christ, salt of the earth, fisher of men, branches and vine. So you've got all these different, um, all these different uh, images of the church. And rather than go through all 96 images, which would take a minute, let's group them. So there are four major groups of images of the church in the New Testament. So number one, the first grouping of images is the people of God. The post-resurrection ecclesia is connected to the Israelite people, the people of God, as a community of pilgrims in a covenant relationship with God, called out for a special task and on a journey to the promised land. The people of God is the biblical theme for the people of God is related to the covenant of God with his people. The, the first covenant was the Mosaic covenant. And the second covenant, as Jesus said, is the covenant in his blood. When we say Old and New Testament, the word testament means covenant. So the, the first image of the church is the people of God. The second image of the church is that of a servant people. We just said that. We just said that the uh, the church serves. Jesus said he did not come to, to serve, but to be served. I'm sorry. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. And so the church is a community of saints who engage in the service of Jesus. The, the, ser the, the church does not exercise power in a self-centered way or lord it over others, but the church must be ready for costly service. So the church is the people of God. That's the first image, first grouping of images. Second grouping of images is the servant people. The third, you've heard, is the body of Christ. That is the primary description that Paul uses to describe the church in his letters. And here's what Paul means by that. So Paul means that the church is a community that participates in one Lord, one spirit, and one baptism, and as a result, are one body. Paul is describing here a supernatural union with Christ and emphasizes the common dependence of the members on each other and on the head, which is Christ. So the image that, that Paul gives of the church as the body of Christ, it expresses mutual dependence, dependence on Jesus as the head and dependence on others as the body. And I don't think I need to break that illustration down. Uh, you know, if you think about the different literal parts of the body and how they are interdependent on each other, that is literally what Paul's saying. Jesus is the head. Cut the head off. There is no body. It doesn't matter. Body dies if the head goes away. What Paul is saying is that the body is interdependent, dependent on Jesus as the head, and then all the different members uh, to varying degrees are interdependent on each other. So that's the third category. And then the fourth category, image of the church, is the community of the spirit. So the church, I told you we were going to explore a little bit that eschatological nature. Well, that's that's what this is, this community of the spirit. The church is an eschatological community that exercises spiritual gifts and exhibits spiritual fruit. Race, class, gender, whatever other political 
that those divisions disappear once one becomes a, a member of the ecclesia, a member of the community of the spirit. Uh, God's people are filled and guided by the paraclete of God. Um, they are, as, as members of the community of spirit, just as the spirit is the agent of creation and life at the first creation, the spirit, the paraclete, is the agent of new creation and new life. And so this, this picture that the ecclesia, the congregation, the, the assembled ones are this community of the spirit. So when you think about the church, if somebody just say, were to say to you, what is the church? What do you mean by that? What do you mean? There's a couple of different answers for that. So first you could say, well, I'll answer the question related to the images that appear in the Bible. So if someone says, what do you mean by church? What is the church? You could say the church is the people of God. It's a servant people assembled, um, serving others um, according to the dictates of the gospel of Jesus. It is the body of Christ with Jesus as the head and all the other people as functioning interdependent members. And the church is the community of the spirit. These people who have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to be loved and love others and to share the love of Jesus um, through spirit led worship and service and community. You could, that's the way you could answer that question. And if you answer the question that way, you know, even if the person doesn't fully understand what you mean, that, that would be one of the most comprehensive answers you could give. If someone asks you, what is the church? I think it's, it's encapsulated in those images. And when you put those images together, that's really the, the picture uh, that develops. So we have images. Well, the, the other way that you could answer the question, if someone says, what is the church? You could, you could answer that question by discussing the nature of the church, which is um, really one of the, the primary reasons for this lecture today was, was to discuss the nature of the church. So there, there are a lot of ways we could study the Christian church, right? And up to this point, we've you know talked about the definition of ecclesia. We understand that when we see the word church in the New Testament, um, if the Greek word being used is ecclesia, then it is a it is a strong connection to the covenantal people of God, right? It's this idea of covenant. The ecclesia are people who live under the covenant of God. Entrance into that covenant now is through the blood of Jesus, right? Um, the old covenant, the old ecclesia, entrance into the covenant was through circumcision and through the law of Moses. And so um, we, we discussed that, the, the word ecclesia and, and kind of what that means. Looked at the images and so I think the next natural part of this lecture is to take a more comprehensive look at the nature of the church. So if somebody were to say to you, what is the church? You could either use those images that I just uh, discussed, or you could say the church is apostolic, the church is missional, the church is sacramental, the church is prophetic, the church is charismatic, and the church is eschatological. You could say that, and let's break those down. So what does it mean for the church to be apostolic? So since the early, earliest days of Christianity, and I, I read this in Acts chapter 2 in the last lecture, 242 and, and forward. Since the earliest days of Christianity, it was important for believers to keep the, keep the doctrines and teachings of the apostles. And throughout history, there has been an emphasis on the doctrines that are grounded in the apostles' teaching. We get the apostles' teaching from the New Testament. Those letters are the teachings of the apostles, right? So, so it's very important that that's the source of our doctrine, the apostles' teaching. And um, if, you've, if you've had me for other lectures, you've probably heard me talk about the, the beginnings of uh, the modern Pentecostal movement and how the Pentecostal movement today is the 
one of the most aggressive Christian movements in the history of Christianity. Well, in the early days of, of the modern Pentecostal movement, which started in 1896 in uh, Western North Carolina, uh, but the big revival was Azusa Street in 1906, is what they were trying to do was they were trying to get back to what they called apostolic Christianity. Um, and there is even a there's even a branch of Pentecostalism that call themselves apostolic. And so um, it's a very more of a legalistic uh, branch. Uh, there a lot of them are oneness, meaning they don't believe in the Trinity, um, but they call themselves apostolic. And that is a term that was used quite frequently in the beginning of the, the 20th century, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century Pentecostal revival. Because it was this idea that the church had potentially gotten away from the full gospel of the apostles, which included the charismatic gifts of the spirit, right? So, so the church is apostolic. What that means is the church adheres to the teachings of the apostles. Number two, the church is missional. I got some pretty strong opinions about what it means for the church to be missional. And I think it's important that um, I share those and that you understand how strongly I feel about it. So the church exists for a few reasons. The primary reason the church exists, aside from worship, is to fulfill the mission of God, to fulfill the great commission and make disciples of all nations. Equally important is the church has an equal responsibility to fulfill that ministry that is described in Matthew 25. And I'll let you read that. Jesus at the end of time says that he'll divide the goats from the, uh, from the sheep. The sheep are those that fed the hungry and clothed the naked and visited the prisoners and visited the sick and all of those things. So the mission of Jesus is the great commission that is making disciples not making converts. Getting conversions and baptisms is only half of the equation. Getting Making disciples is the goal. Making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. That's the goal, right? So the Great Commission is the first part of the mission of God, the mission of Jesus. Uh, the second part of that mission is that mission that he lays out in Matthew 25, which is that that service mission uh, to the needy. And so by Jesus' own admission, you hear my dog, my dog's up now, and he's shaking his collar because he wants to be let out. By his own admission, Jesus' mission, when he read the scroll of Isaiah, which is recorded in Luke chapter 4, by his own admission, Jesus' mission was to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And this is the part I want to make sure you hear me on. If you're a pastor or you're on staff somewhere or you want to start a church or pastor a church one day or you're in leadership at your church, I really need you to, to grasp this next part as an important element of what it means to be the church of Jesus. There is no circumstance whereby a local congregation can accurately profess to be followers of Jesus and not engage in missional activity. To chew on that for a minute. If you have to pause this video and chew on that, I will read it again. I'll say it again. There is no circumstance whereby a local congregation can profess to be followers of Jesus and not engage in missional activity is an essential element of what it means to be the church. So the church is apostolic, the church is missional, is two, and the church three is sacramental. Now, that term sacramental um, invokes various responses depending on uh, your faith tradition, but uh, here's what I mean by sacramental. Uh, for our lecture today. So the church is the arbiter of the holy sacraments.
baptism and communion. Baptism and communion are so ingrained in the, in the life of the Christian church that they, they help to establish or they help to, comp, they help, help to comprise the church's basic nature. So here's another strong statement. Being sacramental is such an essential part of what it means to be the church that a group of people that gather regularly but do not participate in baptism or communion are not a church. It's something else. It's a civic organization or volunteer group or a support group or whatever. But the church engages in the sacraments. It is sacramental by nature. That's number three. Number four, the church is prophetic. So this is something that I talk about quite a bit in, in my classes because it seems to come up, uh, particularly in pneumatology and ecclesiology. But but when, when you hear the word prophetic or you hear the word prophecy, I really need you to make sure that you are thinking about prophecy. Again, this is one of those times when I want you to be thinking theologically and thinking accurately. So prophecy is understood as speaking for God, not just foretelling. So prophecy, biblical prophecy, is not just about the future. Prophets spoke for God. Prophets spoke to contemporary situations. Prophets spoke about past situations. Uh, think about um, David and Bathsheba. When Nathan came to David, he was a prophet, and he uttered, he prophesied about something David had already done. Right. So prophecy is to be understood as speaking for God. In this regard, the church then is the mouthpiece of God on earth. Now, that doesn't mean that everything the church says is from God. What that does mean is that God has chosen his church to be his vessel to speak through, for better or worse, right? So I don't want you to think that the if when I say the church is prophetic and the church speaks for God, that doesn't mean everything the church says is from God. What it means is the church is God's chosen vessel in whom he has decided by his sovereign will to be the vessel to whom he speaks through. And what that means is preaching then becomes the chief prophetic activity of the church. Preaching is a prophetic activity. Now, this is just a this is just an aside, and you can do with it what you will. But if preaching is the chief activity of prophecy, and I want you to think about Joel, the prophet Joel, and I want you to think about uh, in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches the first sermon. People hear a noise, they hear people praising God in their own language, and they say, well, these folks are drunk. Peter addresses the crowd, says, we're not drunk. It's morning. But this, whatever's happening, right? What's happening is the spirit has filled. The paraclete has come. This is that which the prophet Joel spoke of, saying, in the last days, says God, I will pour my spirit out on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. God says that sons and daughters will prophesy. Preaching is the chief prophetic activity of the church. So that is number four. Number five, the church is charismatic. The church is comprised of spirit-filled people that exercise spiritual gifts. The Greek word uh, for spiritual gifts is pneumatikos. Paul uses the term in, in 1 Corinthians 12 to, to discuss those spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit is immeasurably vital to the life of the Christian church. It is 
it's so vital. And I, and I have a hard time sometimes wrapping my mind around this and I have to think it out. But the Holy Spirit is so important to God's plan of redemption. That Jesus said, it's better. It's better that I go away. Because if I go away, the paraclete will come. Jesus himself, the, the incarnate Son of God, God in the flesh, said, it's better that he ascends to heaven so that the paraclete will come. So the church is, is to be and is charismatic in that the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the paraclete of God, works through the church to reach the world. So that's the church is charismatic. Lastly, the church is eschatological. The church not only looks forward to the coming of the kingdom of God, but the church also participates in the kingdom of God in the here and now. Now, something you've probably heard in some of your other theology classes is this concept of already, not yet. So when we say that, what we mean is that the Spirit of God in us is the fulfillment, the, the here and now fulfillment of the kingdom of God already. But it also yearns for that coming kingdom of God when, when the, the plan of God will be fully complete and we will be free from these these earthen vessels and the temptations and the tempter. So, so the church is eschatological, meaning that the church, and this is related to the church's charismatic, but it's, it's, a, but it's its own category. The church is eschatological in that the church is already, but not yet. The church is exercising in the spirit, the mission of God now but longing for that day when the trumpet sounds and God's people are called forward. So we've said a lot in this lecture. We talked about ecclesia, talked about images of the church, uh, activity of the church, uh, the nature of the church. Um, I hope that you were able to keep up. hope I wasn't too scattered uh, on all this, but um I'll try to end every lecture the same way. If you have questions or concerns or didn't quite understand something or you just want to talk more about some of the things I've lectured on, uh, send me an email or text me. Uh, my number's in the, in the syllabus. Hopefully by now uh, you've saved my number uh, to your phone. But uh, thanks for participating in today's lecture. I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks.